and we'll we'll get going. Um, thank you for joining us. You all know the presentation title at this point. We're looking at restrooms today. Um, Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah. Our our obligatory uh, slide with all of our learning objectives. This um, is uh, health and wellness or health and safety. AIA credits for those that need to do your AIA credits as well. Um, and this is going to be part of our design and education, design of educational facilities for our core competency today. Um, we're all gonna introduce ourselves. Go ahead, Vice President. Thank you, Pat. Hello everyone, I'm Andrea Alexander, the Vice President of Administrative Services over at Evergreen Valley College. Happy to be here and meet all of you. Hello, everyone. My name is Kim Coffeen, and I'm an architect at Perkins Eastman, and a shameless pug, also ALIP. If you guys uh, want to continue to uh, uh, expand your knowledge of, of this profession, I really encourage you to look into the academy. Um, but very much happy to be here and excited uh, to, to have these conversations. Great. Thank you. And Ty Taylor, I'm with Gross Ford and Dunleavy. I am also an accredited learning environment planner. Um, sit on the commission with um, Kim, and I'm your past president and two-time president for um, the Southwest region uh, for a for OE. So we're going to be talking about San Jose Evergreen Community College today. Um, San Jose Evergreen Community College, or EVC, um, the campus that we're going to be talking about is South Bay, um, just about 40 miles south of San Francisco, um, near the San Jose Airport. And it is a very large campus. Um, the campus currently has a bond. The district has a bond of $738 million. And it was portioned out into three pieces, um, about a third to each um, of the three campuses. Um, and this is the EVC campus. We've got four large projects that are on this campus. Um, we've got up in the top, Plan North here, we've got a language arts building which is to bring um, a lot of various language arts teachers from different separate buildings on campus into one building to provide all of those services under one roof. We've got um, in the plan east over there, we've got a nursing program that is expanding. And so we're providing a new nursing building on that portion of the campus. Plan South is a new general education building, taking a whole bunch of general education classes that are in a DSA non-compliant um, building because of an earthquake fault, um, bringing them down to a brand new facility, three stories, and we'll talk about that building today. And then out here, Plan West in our um, parking lot is going to be our new student services building where we are bringing all student service um, pieces under one building, making it a one-stop shop. This was an elevator. Thank you. So a little bit about the college in general that we're in the Bay Area. We toggle mostly between having about 43% Latino, Hispanic population, and then about 41 <laughs> Asian <laughs> population. And when I say toggle, because th three years, it can change by points. And sometimes we have uh, the, the disparity where the Asian students are 43 and Latino students are 41. But for the most part, that is what we're looking at. When it comes to our particular college, we have the traditional college going ages, usually between 18 and 24. Y'all know, and I'm not that boring, but um, I'm making a joke. Uh, but <laughs> our traditional, uh, we mostly have traditional uh, age college students between 18 and 21. And of course, as you know, in higher education, there are always more students who identify as female at 54 to 55% versus male. So we are a traditional community college serving in the Bay Area is high mention. So that's a little bit about us as it relates to this presentation. Okay. So another big part of the presentation today is um, trying to take the politics out of bathrooms, but we can't ignore some of the statistics that are out there. Um, so we're gonna go through a couple of slides real quick about statistics of LGBT plus students in higher education. Um, this is based off of a survey of 180,000 students from the Association of American Universities. 17% of our students on campus um, currently represent themselves as LGBT+. Of that, 10% of those students, or 1.7% of the total, 
identify as transgender, non-binary, or, um, or questioning. Crime against students on campus that's based on um, sex, hate crimes based on campus, 2% of them, or they're the second most motivating bias for um, crime on campus is sexual orientation. Sorry that I stumbled through that one. 60% <laughs> of transgender non-binary questioning um, gender not listed students feared for their physical safety when this um, survey was done in 2020. 30% compared to 16% of non-LGBT um, peers experience housing challenges. Gay men are paid 31% less, according to Prudential, than their um, non-LGBT peers. Lesbian women are paid 11% less than their non-LGBT peers. In um, education, including elementary, middle school, and high school, um, an LGBT student is three and a half times as likely to attempt suicide. A trans person is almost six times as likely to attempt suicide. 22% of LGBT students choose a college that is away from their home specifically to search for a safe space. LGBT students are three times as likely to be assaulted on a campus. And LGBT college students are four times as likely to attempt suicide or commit self-harm. So how, what does this have to do with bathrooms, right? This is super heavy information, it's discomforting. Students go to, go to school, they go to college because they're trying to achieve self-actualization, right? Maslow's hierarchy of need, we want to do something to better ourselves. That's the highest achievement that we can do to ourselves. That's, that's how we better ourselves. But when we are not providing our physiological needs of safety, shelter, I'm sorry, of air, food, water, shelter, clothing, and bathroom, or we're not providing our safety needs, 60% of those students didn't feel safe. We don't feel love and belonging, and we don't have self-respect, self-esteem. We're not recognized in the community. And I speak as part of that community. How do we ever expect our students to graduate and achieve that self-actualization? So we developed a, a survey, and I'm going to hand this over to Vice President Alexander to speak of the survey that we developed. Thank you. So when we were looking at the construction of all of these great new buildings we were going to have on campus, it became an idea that, hey, we want there to be diversity and inclusion because that is the fundamental uh, mission of the college is we are grounded in social justice, equity, and opportunity. And one of the things that was, became very apparent definitely to me when I started at the college in 2017 is that, that there wasn't this safe space for LGBTQ plus students along with some other students who felt that they were on the margins of that, whether they I did identify as being non-binary or intersex or what have you. And so what we wanted to make sure we, we did is that these buildings, as you all know here in the profession, are built for 30 and 50 years down the line. You can't build them for today because today will change as we saw in the pandemic era in the blink of an eye. So we were trying to be forward thinking, but we also recognized we had a lot of people on campus, namely, unfortunately, our faculty and our older generation of community uh, members who were not necessarily so quick to want to jump to having a more open and equitable space when it came to rest uh, room use, including individual space. So what we did um, through the help definitely of Ty is we went and we talked to Dr. Hosford at the time, he was at St. Mary's, and he had developed a survey specifically to address these sort of things so that people at least could let us know what their fears were, what they were unsure of, and things like that. And as we go through, you see some of what we were talking about was this notion of do people have issues with sharing a bathroom or do they really have issues if it was a private bathroom or is if, if we say inclusive, what does that mean? So we really wanted to understand that. And this particular doctor had developed a survey to do that already. We released it to the campus, got feedback from students, faculty, and the like. And basically what it is, is the idea that the private, the stalls themselves, as you see, 
are indeed closed from floor to ceiling. I think people have this notion that shared bathrooms are like the ones when you go in and you just have basically the division and you could actually reach under and give people toilet paper go over. <laughs> but that is not, that is what people think of because they're thinking about it in the lens in which they're used to going to the restaurant. When what we were really trying to sort of do is get rid of that notion of those kind of partitions and say, no, you're going to have a floor to ceiling door and allow that, but you will have a shared wash space. Interestingly enough, it's the same thing you do when you go to a restaurant and no one complains, but people get afraid when you say, okay, let's bring this. So that's what this survey was trying to do. First of all, put people in the frame of mind of what it actually meant. Get the feedback from our students because they're the ones we have to service in 20 or 30 years. And understand, and then lo and behold, I'll turn it over to Ty to give a little bit more of the results and how that came to be. Yeah. Thank you. So let's finish scrolling through the questions here. You'll see that all of the questions we're asking, um, if you've been able to read them as they're going, how do you feel safety-wise on a scale that we provided of one to five um, in an individual and private space, knowing that the bathroom has floor-to-ceiling walls, locks from the inside, has um, safety from the hallway that it can be seen, um, you're not going to be able to get trapped in this type of a space. And we ask these questions in multiple different ways, except for the last question. Knowing that an all-inclusive restroom is a private room with floor-to-ceiling separation and locks from the inside makes me feel. This is the crux of all of our research that we did. So we'll go through that and you might see why that was kind of important. So the first question, how do you feel safe? How do you feel using traditional restrooms, separated male and female group restrooms as shown below? 35 and 36% said they feel safe or somewhat safe. Now, when we go to the question of how safe do you feel using an individual and private single person restroom shown below with the features of being able to know, is it occupied? The, the visibility from the hallway. A lot of the research that Cunningham Group has already done, we built off of that. 33% jump in the very safe category for this style of restroom. Then you pair that with the next question, what is your preferred type of restroom? Now I combine those top two, the 69 and the 6%. If someone's gonna use either, in my mind, they're probably gonna go with a private rather than a, a gender segregated restroom, but if they had the choice, it, it doesn't matter to them. But 75% of, of the respondents said that they would use an individual or private, paired with 85 report feeling safe or very safe. This is driving us to believe that our students and our faculty and our staff are okay with individual and private types of restrooms. Would you use a series of public sinks? Overwhelmingly, yes but the no answers were important. So we asked why. Didn't have a spot to put my purse. Didn't have a spot to use a mirror. Didn't have a spot to fix my, my head, um, head wearing devices that I might have for cultural reasons. So we took that into consideration. Again, asking the same type of question, knowing that um, it's thick floor to ceiling walls, how safe do you feel? 86%. Having a restroom door that can be seen from the hallway. We expected a little bit of a different result here. And when we looked at the feedback, one of the answers that we received was, um, I would be worried about who would be standing outside the door when I come out. But then we think about that. What happens when you go into a gender segregated restroom? You go through a door. And then inside that door is stalls where people could be hiding. But you have to come back out that same door to get into the hallway, right? So how is that different than going into a private door and having to come back out into the hallway? So it was a fear that's not necessarily based in a fact, but it's a feeling. Again, this is the same question, but reworded from question five. And then this is where the shock came in. Knowing that an all-inclusive restroom is all of these same things that we've been talking about. Look at how much very safe fell. 12%, somewhat safe went up only 2%. 
but down here in the somewhat unsafe and very unsafe doubled in their values, all because of one word, all inclusive. So that's why we are talking to our students and our faculty and staff about individual and private restrooms, because the nomenclature meant something to this campus. And so uh, the way I want to address this is, is to give a few anecdotes on it. Um, basically, uh, some of the things that we noticed, because Ty definitely brought out the LGBTQ plus community and in that. And some of the things that we really, really, really noticed about that is that if we wanted to be an all-inclusive environment and we wanted to do all of these things, the idea that people have to actually find a place to go and could not partic partake in a restroom in a building that they are receiving education like everyone else seemed like a major disadvantage to us. And then I look at it from the side that always hits me. And I say this <laughs> nicely, is that I'm, I, people wouldn't know this, but I am from Chicago, great city in the Midwest, not the East Coast. West Coast people always think it's in the East, it's not the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> It's in the Midwest. And the great, well, not, well, one of the disadvantages is I never got a chance to go to Disneyland, Disney World growing up. And I recently went for my birthday. I know, old kid, but I went. Got the ears and everything. And I went through, uh, they have like metal detectors you go through. And, and the, the, the uh, security guy was so nice. He started talking to me like Donald Duck. And I was like, what the heck just happened? And they're like, it's the happiest place on earth. Even the security is nice. And so I went through the park and I was like, wow, yeah, I'm like, oh. I feel like a kid. And I loved it. And I was feeling it and I saw the inclusion. And then I said, huh, got on a couple of rides. So I got to go to the bathroom. I got to go to the bathroom. And the catalyst for why this was so important to me, not, uh, but as a woman, went to the bathroom at Disney. The line was around the corner for women and there was no line for men. So when we look at this, it's basically saying that my physiological needs aren't as important as the men because they can get in and go and I have to wait online because usually the people designing it are usually men. And even though they know that this is happening time and time again in architecture, they still do it. <laughs> Women have to go around and wait around the corner and men can go in and out. But you're saying to me, then my needs aren't as important as theirs, even in the happiest place on earth. And that always takes me back to how I frame it when I look at our students, when I look at what we're doing and how we design things. What are we saying to people? Because when you don't bring or bring forth their normal basic needs, it affects their self-esteem. I don't belong here. I and who I show up is not important. It's so important, not so not important. I can't even go to the bathroom across the hall from my class. Because we're asking them to choose to be in our world. And so I wanna bring that out just to let people understand it's not just LGBTQ and non-binary, it's women, it's accessibility, it's all of those things. And I just don't want us to get caught in what is safety and what isn't. Because the truth of the matter is, if we have a locked door, if it's from sky to ceiling or ceiling to floor, it's just like being in a private restaurant. We just changed the name of it. And it totally took to the survey and surprise point, changed the connotation. But more importantly, we don't want to exclude people by trying to make other people comfortable. The two are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> OK? So good design should provide solutions to those with the highest needs, but architecture provides solutions that benefit everyone, not just those in need. So this is uh, from Cunningham Group. This is where all of our research has started. I know a lot of you have seen this um, image. It's been at our conferences for a handful of years now. Um, the Department of General Services for California just adopted this as an example of things that we should be looking at here in California. Um, and it's happening in Colorado, it's happening in Minnesota, it's happening all over the country now with Cunningham Group's um, championship for this type of inclusion. 
Um, so what are the features though that are important here? And I'm stealing a little bit of Cunningham's thunder, but I appreciate that they've done this research for us. The doors are on a hold open, 20 degree hold open. Why is that? It's so that as you're walking past the doors, you can see, is there somebody hiding inside that restroom? Because safety is important. 20 degree hold open also makes you have to pull the door shut. Once you pull the door shut and you lock it from the inside, you have that sense of security that you have locked that door. You know you're in a safe space. On the outside of that door, once it's locked, you can have an indicator at the top on the ceiling that goes from red to green or green to red, saying it's occupied or vacant. You can also have on the physical lock, just like you would see on a porta potty, vacant or occupied in bright red text or bright green text. The sinks are exposed. But there's opportunity for mirrors either on the back sides of the doors inside that private space or on some of these column areas that you can see um, in the hallway. The idea is that this is all exposed to the hallway for better um, safety and better observation from faculty and staff from like the K-12 perspective, being able to observe the restrooms. Bullying ultimately goes away in this type of situation. There's no more fear of using the restroom because you don't know what's going to happen behind that closed door. What are some of the things that do need to happen though when you do this? You need a fire sprinkler in each stall. You need an evac fan in each stall and you need um, a horn and a strobe in each stall. So there is a little bit of increased cost. However, that increased cost is, um, one over by knowing that your plumbing count stays the same, but the square footage is reduced by about 50%. So you can provide the same solution with the same amount of um, plumbing fixtures per the code and save it's about 48.5% of your square footage. And in California, when we're building in the Bay Area at $1,400 a square foot, that's a lot of savings that you get to put back into your classrooms, back into your teaching spaces and give it back to the students. Um, points three and four are what I really wanna hit on here. I'll let you read the rest of them, but point number three, we all have facilities that already have gender segregated restrooms. What if I want to do this in my renovation? Our um, estimators have gone through a number of scenarios and to demo a gender segregated restroom and rebuild it as in, in um, an individual and private space is about 15 to 20% more costly than just renovating the restroom. And when I say renovating, I'm meaning taking out the tile, taking out the, the plumbing fixtures and rebuilding gender segregated in its existing place. So it's a 20% increased investment in your students if you have um, an existing facility. However, if you do it at your planning and programming phase, it's two to 3% additional cost. That's nothing when you're talking about a $100 million new school to make sure that your students can achieve Maslow's hierarchy of need better. So I'm gonna hand this over to Kim to talk about a couple of her projects. Yeah, and actually if you could go to the next slide. Oh yeah. Um, one thing I wanna reinforce is um, as, as our profession kind of requires us to do is think about um, basis of design and, and your educational specs as a component of the work that you do with clients. So if the client brings forth a program to you and you can see sort of the traditional model and no, no recognition of this type of um, planning, I encourage you to bring forth an ed spec or even the Cunningham group um, to get that conversation started. Um, a little bit about this project, it was actually reviewed as a collaborative process through DSA. Um, so I think that brought the opportunities for these discussions to happen early in the planning process. Um, and one of the distinct things that I think is important about our code is um, when you look at, in this particular case, you see that the hallway and uh, the building or the restroom is sort of off the hallway and it's really sort of distinct room. But another example we'll share with you is where we rotate it and it's sort of like the example of the Cunningham where it comes off a hallway. Um, sometimes DSA may look at that and say, oh, that looks more like a unisex restroom. And when, if that's the case, 
they're saying, oh, that needs a sink in it and it needs to be bigger and so forth. So really having this as a distinct space, a distinct room with finishes, ceiling changes, color wayfinding um, is important. So just to point out a couple things, um, the stall at the top is the accessible stall and it needs to be five foot six. So your regular turnaround circle that you typically at five foot um, has to enlarge a bit because of the um, floor to ceiling walls. Um, also the hallway going in, you wanna make sure that two people in a wheelchair can pass by. Um, so make sure it's wide enough. I think in this case, it's probably close to eight feet. Um, and um, as mentioned, you know, you have the separate um, uh, strobes, but actually you can have the horn outside as long as the decibels are loud enough that you can hear when the doors are closed. Um, so those are just some of the tips, but um, we did actually design this, um, you, thinking about it as holistic. So it wasn't a male female uh, calculation. Um, so as many ur urinals that were required, it just translated into water closets. And they eventually um, uh, provided ultimately more, more plumbing fixtures that were needed. Um, so you can sort of see it off the hallway. Um, and I think the next slide might be, yeah. A language arts, I think you're gonna yeah. go right into that. Yeah, sure. Um, just a couple things that I wanted to hit on this is also, you talked about it a little bit, but the, the width of, mm -hmm. um, of this threshold, that was a word that we all hated from architecture school, threshold. Mm -hmm. And I kid you not, we had a theory conversation with DSA about threshold and what is a door? And, um, <clears throat> And they thought that was a door. And I said, no, it's not. That is an extension of the hallway. There is no door here. And so you'll see that when um, Kim mm -hmm. talks about the general education building, we talked about it again, the theory of a threshold. <laughs> um, language arts. This project is uh, by JK Architecture and Engineering. And this building is all about inclusion. Um, it's all about language and how do we bring students together on campus through that story. Um, we attempted a second design um, approach in this option. Um, I guess I'll give you a little bit of orientation. We have a very large lecture hall on this side of the building, um, over 200 seats in this space, lobby directly off of the main quad, classrooms on both sides, double loaded corridor, three stories, and this restroom is replicated on each floor. This is a horseshoe shaped restroom still can pass um, two wheelchairs around that entire horseshoe with no opportunity to be trapped in that space. That threshold reaches from this column to this column with your um, sinks and water station inside that threshold. There is a seating area on the outside in, uh, in front of that large black column there. And then the mirrors and the sinks are completely interior to the restroom. However, it is still very exposed to that hallway for all of those same needs that we talked about, the doors being on the hold open, um, et cetera. Again, more, more plumbing count in this option by choice than what was required by code because we were still saving square footage and we wanted to provide um, that additional plumbing count for all of the students, especially with that large lecture hall just off the hallway. So with all the schematics, now we're just going to look at what it really looks like from the novice eye, as a professional, I'm a novice eye in the room. And so basically, this is the lobby of the language arts building we have here. The restrooms are right over here, very open space. You might ask about the color. That was intentional, too, because we wanted to make sure we're bringing in the vibe of different cultures and diversity and open space and glass and things like that. That's what the students requested. Did the faculty? No. <laughs> what the students did. And they wanted the bathrooms to be a part of that, something that's very open, something that it's not conforming, something that's just a restroom. You don't have to decide which gender you are that day <laughs> to use it. And so this is another example. Again, it's gonna say individual private restrooms. Remember, it's not all inclusive because just that connotation changes how people perceive their safety. And so as Ty sort of said, here's the seating area right in front. This is one side of the bathroom. It looks the same on the other. And of course, you can go in, turn around. It's right there. They're all individual. We're excited about that. You know, our students will be excited about this.
this is all very, very intentional. And I did want to share with you an image of a sign that I recently had a cafe that it says, this restroom may be used by any person regardless of gender identity or expression. And it had a symbol um, and um, also the accessible wheelchair. So um, signage is an important component of, of what, what this is about. So if you go to the next slide, again, this is very different. Again, um, as you can see, the opening is much wider with a larger kind of area here and then the um, accessible restroom to the right. I did want to point out, and I think this might be an extension of the next iteration, is a family room. Um, we do have a um, pull-down baby changing station. So I think that's part of the next iteration of this, is how to address sort of all of those components of our community. Um, but um, I, we do have the sign that is, I think the next slide is kind of a nicer one, where it shows that, but there's, um, a sign that is specifically for this space and then the accessible restroom has the signage itself. So again, it's not saying that this is a unique door that you have to go through. Everybody can go through that door. So. And I do, if we could just go back for one, I do want to say that this was something that was actually intentional for the college as far as having this big opening in this particular building. Why? Because all of the other buildings on campus that will have the individual stalls, we actually have several managers who are in that building. So we have more staff members in the building. This is more the general education building. It doesn't have a designated landing manager or dean. And so with that, we wanted to make sure things were very open so that there could be nothing hidden in there. People could hide and people had that sense of safety. So thank you all so much for going to DSA and fighting that battle. But that was very intentional. And each one had to be designed based on the needs of that building. So it was still very unique to mm -hmm. it. Okay. Uh, and do you want to introduce Dr. Drew? Certainly. So um, when I came to the college in 2017, we had begun to work on the idea of, at that time, we called them all inclusive restrooms. And I had been working on it for quite a while until the legislation was passed in about 2019 that said they wanted to ha make sure that all community college or California community college campuses had restrooms that were in that case, they called them gender neutral. We had to have them a certain amount per square footage of the buildings. But then in about 2020, Dr. Tamil Gerhelson, who is our president of our college, came and she has been a godsend because she actually sits as the chair uh, of the CEO housing affordability sort of task force with the state. And she works around ideas of diversity and inclusion. So she was big in helping us get this through the district. And we've actually recently passed a resolution that deals with restrooms and deals with our LGBTQ community, specifically dealing with accepting of this and making sure we're creating a nurturing environment. The board has already accepted this and wants us to go in this direction. And we feel like we're on the cutting edge of where this is gonna be in most higher education institutions, at least in the state of California. So Ty was kind enough to do an interview with President Gilkerson because she couldn't be here today, but she really, really wanted to be a part of this and just express her thoughts on this as well. So we're gonna show that. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Ty. Um, hi, everybody. I am really sorry that I'm not able to be there today, but you've had what is an incredible presentation from a team of colleagues that I really um, think very highly of and appreciate their ability to like really think about strategy and the intersection of like serving our students with heart and how design build really is a reflection of the values of an institution. And so they've been great partners in it. And Ty, I really appreciate the time with you today. So I wanted to ask you, Dr. Gokerson, why was it so important to you and coming from your background as well from multiple campuses, why were the individual and private restrooms such a goal for you on this campus? I think, you know, Ty, it's such an interesting thing because, um, you know, I had the opportunity to be uh, the president of a campus of a college in Oakland, California, before I came to Evergreen Valley College. And it was there through an experience with students that were really telling me about their own lived experience that really made me stop and think about um, what did it mean for me as an educator? What did it mean for me as a president of an institution and thinking about how we um, offer and deliver services and what we say to students was going to sort of be actualized. And so I had a student, um, transgender student, 
who changed my life really and gave me the opportunity not to just come to me to complain, but actually came to share their individual journey and their story. So this student was in machine technology on one side of a very, you know, 60 acre campus um, who was way over on the side. And we thought we are doing all this great stuff by like putting maps of where all the, you know, all gender is what we were calling at the time, or our gender inclusive restrooms were the safe spaces, single stalled restrooms, individuals, you know, putting maps around campus saying what this is and thinking that we had done our job. We had met the ed code, we had met the section, right? Of, you know, um, allowing that sort of ability for students. And this student came to me and said, Do you know that actually I have to walk? I have a break in my class. I have to run all the way across campus. President Gilkerson, like to go to a bathroom that feels safe for me, I'm actually walking, you know, 10 minutes across campus to get to that bathroom. And then 10 minutes back, I don't have time to eat. I have to hold it when I'm, you know, in class and I need to go, not at the prescribed break time. And that actually was having real detrimental um, issues on their health. Um, on their ability to sort of feel like they belonged in the community. And they actually um, helped inspire me to say, like, how do I step back and hear from not just you, but more students on our campus and also the faculty and staff. And so it really became a years long journey um, to understand what it is like and what we need to do to support transgender, gender nonconforming and intersex students. Um, on our college campuses and to recognize the fluidity in a generation of students that are coming forward and seeking, you know, safe spaces to learn on our campuses. And so that's really what inspired me. And the work started with faculty, classified professionals and students at Laney College teaching me about this, thinking about and modeling and thinking about design. And that came with me when I came um, to Evergreen Valley College and getting to work with this incredible team that we have here. Yeah, I think one of the really awesome things that we found while we were doing the survey is that you have faculty and staff and students who through this process of responding to the survey finally felt that they had a safe space. And I know that there's some people that ultimately chose to even come out through this process and have shared some of those lived experiences. Um, how do you think that this is going to impact the culture of Evergreen Valley College? Yeah, so it's a really interesting thing because, again, what I was saying is I think that there's something principled about the way we design things, right? So we have a universal design idea when we think about education and really quality like instruction, right? Like how do we think of it broadly from a universal design perspective and then also from a design perspective that is about having universal targeted goals? And then how do we think with equity um, in mind to help support other places where we often traditionally, particularly in a westernized, very like cisgendered, like, you know, binary world to think about things in a particular way. And so the same goes with designing the functional spaces, right? Placemaking is such a big part of, you know, again, what I said earlier is about values and what that does. And so we know that the learning learned environment tells a story to students. And I've been in places that have been run down and broken down. Down. And, you know, you can feel how faculty feel, how students feel, how they feel in that environment in terms of allowing them to blossom and really feel safe in learning. And we know from Maslow's hierarchy and even lots of other studies, right, that that is a baseline. Safety is a baseline to education. So I think it's going to be transformative in the fact that it actually really undergirds the foundational values of Evergreen Valley College, right? Equity, opportunity, and social justice as being those sort of mission, you know, driven principles that we have. Um, and I also just might share one little story that I think is important to share because I have been at where I call very progressive institutions, right? Where, I mean, you don't have social justice in people's missions, right? Like, I mean, these are the kind of colleges. So I understand that this is not the same lived experience to actually lead an institution in an area that is maybe more conservative or has a different in design or intention or, or, you know, political beliefs or values. And I understand that. And I recognize that. I think part of where I center the work is around learning. 
Um, the fact that like what I knew when I was going to school is much different than it is now that learning, you, you know, back when I was, and even generations before me, right. I'm still, you know, fairly young, but even generations before me has changed so much. And so even with our built environment, if we can honor the fact, right, that learning is recursive and it continues to happen, the institution should model that same sort of assessment and do that in every sort of space. So when we were going to these individual and private restrooms in a design building at a different campus, and so I'll just use this as an example, the campus that I was at previously, it was actually a battle. It was a huge battle. It was very painful. I had you know, folks of color, uh, faculty, staff, and everybody saying that this was not going to be safe. Having this sort of restroom with shared like wash, you know, sort of sink areas and stuff like that. And they began to equate students who might be gender nonconforming, transgender, non-binary to be like sexual predators. And I'm just being completely honest, right? It was like, I'm worried about being raped. I'm worried about these sort of things. And so it was one painful to sit in the space for with me with them, but I also had to recognize that faculty and staff also, for whatever generation and lens they had, had a, their own lived experience and concerns about their own safety and what that meant. And so part of it is, you know, in these sort of opportunities, I really found that in having these dialogues, and it was multiple dialogues and surveys at both campuses and places, is that you're allowing people to learn again in a safe space about something that, that is uncomfortable for them. And so I do believe that there'll be some folks who are a little bit uncomfortable when they move into the new building and actually, you know, those who haven't been paying attention, it will be a space of discomfort, right? Um, but I think if we don't ever center the dialogue about, you know, sort of these principles that we espouse to do, then, you know, what are, you know, what are we doing? So I think we're all better from actually, you know, really rethinking um, the design of our spaces in this way. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And you and I have had a lot of conversations about this, and I think we could go on and on for another half hour, but I wanted to thank you for, for being a champion for the community, for your students, for your faculty and staff. Um, I know this is going to be huge for um, the campus and it's going to set a precedent. So thank you for being a champion. Thank you so much, Ty. Thanks, everybody. Take good care. So that leads us to what I was really hopeful we would have 15 minutes of time to answer your questions because I know there's always questions. Yeah. Gosh. I haven't had to answer the question yet. Um, I'm getting very close with some gymnasium renovations that we're about to start. And I don't know how to apply this in the appropriate way to a gymnasium restroom. Um, I think there's a very different um, atmosphere that a locker room provides um, than just being able to go and use a restroom. And um, I'm looking forward to that challenge, but I don't have a, I don't have a solution to it yet. I, I have worked on a, a project for um, ELAC, East LA College. Um, and it's not as far as I'd like it to go, but it does solve some issues. And I think really what it came down to is adding additional privacy. Um, so we do have um, dedicated changing rooms in the various areas, but also um, all of the stalls, you know, went down to the, you know, definitely with privacy. Um, and in this case, we also included a um, single use um, shower changing area for students experiencing homelessness. Um, so again, it may not go as far, but there are things that you can do that sort of help alleviate some of the concerns. Privacy. Yeah, I think you, we did look at it. There was, of course, a cost implication to it, but there also transitions from um, a cluster of that, or it transitions from this type of restroom into a cluster of individual rooms then and at that point you also trip into some code requirements of having to provide 50 percent of those spaces now at the ada stall size mm -hmm. um, so when you include all of those features within one individual space we tripped into a different type of mm -hmm. code 
analysis. Yeah. And, and if I, if, we, if I could, I also want to address the, the, uh, the, how should we so say the social cognitive portion of that is that a lot of times, uh, cause we did look at that. We looked at if it was cost uh, prohibitive or not. And so we did a lot, or I, I know we did, and I, I know I did personally, did a lot of research on the cultural dynamics of that and found out that's not true. No one can see their hair, hair garb, men or women. So it wasn't about coming out of the restroom and feeling exposed because no one is supposed to. That's why we went to the mirrors and things. So a big part of it is with the unsafe, that's some of the things that came out. And it turns out these things actually aren't true these what if these scenarios. And so it's understanding that you're looking at the, the cost prohibitive part of it, but you're also trying to bring in the social part of it at the same time. And, and if you try to do one versus the other, I don't think it will get very far, i.e. the locker room versus bringing them together because it's too big of a hotbed issue, even in design. And I know that professionals in the room and that's the role I play. If you try to just do it on logic, logic alone won't work. It will never work. At, these four projects are actively under construction right now. So we've not been able to do post-occupancy on, on this set of examples. Um, I don't know the statistics from Cunningham Group on their Colorado Public School implementation or their Minneapolis or their St. Paul um, applications. However, I have heard that they've been highly successful and they haven't had um, troubles around ownership and respect of the space. And I, and I will say this part because, again, we haven't had it with the private uh, bathrooms as they are now. But we have had it around our campus because, and we do have a middle college. So we do actually house a lot of K through 12, mostly high school students who come to us between freshman and senior year. So every day we have about 250 to 300 high school students on our campus. And what we found when it comes to the vandalism, even the private restrooms, um, they follow the older people in the area. It's crazy as that might sound. Um, and I've noticed that since the beginning, even though I'm not, I can't speak fully to K-12, K but when I started convincing the faculty and staff they had to treat the, the environment better, those young people who were in our middle college and our students automatically did. And I think it's a misnomer sometimes. The nicer the space, they want it to be nice too. They, they truly do. If, if you give them partitions that are ugly and dank and the traditional taupe and gray and silver, no, really, I, I, you know, it looks like a traditional institution. And I don't mean of higher education, I mean, you know, they're going to treat it like that. But the more lively, the more vibrant, the more idea that you're giving them diversity and all of that, they treat it from K to school. That's my experience, I'm only speaking from in the, in the research I've done, they treat it as such. There was a question over here and then I'll come back to that side. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so as we went through this process, um, our third iteration, the ADA stall now has the sink in it, but all of them have the sanitary disposal in it as well. Um, we, all, we still though have one off individual and private stalls elsewhere in the building that would just be a single user like a family um, type of stall. So those will still be there. They're all, all of the needs are still enclosed in those restrooms as well. And, and if I may, Ty, we noticed also, again, I know it's a product of my lens. I want to make, there, in all of the new buildings, we made sure to do a lactate room because that bothers me. And it's not, of course, gender specific. And so if I say that to say, yes, I would say for the K through 12 and the experience I've had, and just because of just of where they are in their development, it's no knock on them, it's where they are in their development. I, if, if I was to do this for K through 12 with what I know now, I would, have, I, would put a, I would put individual sort of rooms either on the side or within this for those specific things. When women are mature, or young girls are maturing and young men are going through whatever they're going through. No, and, and I think because that's part of development as well. We don't want to shame that. In, in the process of trying to be open to everybody. And so I would recommend that because that's what we're doing for those situations for older people. It's, it's not a reduced plumbing count. We have, the, we have the equal amount of plumbing count as if you were to have segregated male and female restrooms. 
because what we found through looking at the floor plans is oftentimes if you have a need for one urinal and one toilet, but on the other side, you have a need for four toilets for women, the male side is just generally expanded. The, if you're looking at just the plumbing count side of it, right. And so you're saving square footage by being able to reduce it down to just the plumbing count that you need. Yep. Yeah, Letty, thank you for articulating that because that's what I was trying to find in my, is that it's the minimum count. And what Cunningham Group has found is that by moving all of this from urinal to water closet, mm -hmm. it increases the opportunity of stall use for women two times and three times for men. The point is it increases the toilet count for everybody.